So I just wanted to make this video about the uh, influence of Zoroastrianism on the Abrahamic religions, especially uh, Judaism. Um, uh, I'm not particularly interested in Zoroastrianism as a religion, but I think it's important to understand uh, these influences because um, th they tell us about the, the larger influences of the Indo-European peoples and the Indo-European religions on um, the Abrahamic faiths and uh, and then um, into our societies uh, more recently. Most people don't actually understand uh, just how influential Zoroastrianism and early Iranian um, uh, religious ideas were on the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, this goes back all the way to the beginning of, Ab of the Abrahamic religions. Uh, one of Abraham's most uh, defining moments was uh, his destruction of the idols uh, in this idol shop. Um, the idea being that you shouldn't worship idols now this is a sentiment that we also see in um, other uh, religions and other peoples, especially within around that region and especially Iranian speaking peoples. The Zoroastrians themselves didn't actually build idols or didn't have idols of uh, the god Zoroaster. And the uh, Scythians didn't seem to have idols either, uh, nor the Germanic people or the Bato Slavic people. All of these people, the Germanic and Bato Slavic peoples, are related to the Scythians. And the Scythians were quite close to the uh, Zoroastrian I Iranians and both spoke the same language. So it seems like this anti um, idol worship was something which was more common in that region at that time and found its way into a, um, Abrahamic religions um, quite earlier on. And we can also see a similar parallel with um, uh, genetic data. If we uh, look at the, uh, the DNA of the um, Ashkenazi Levites, which are a, a priestly uh, group within the, the Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews, um, we can see quite a lot of uh, haplogroup, Y-DNA haplogroup R1A, which is mostly a Indo-European um, genetic uh, haplogroup. Um, most likely came from Iran at some point. Now some people say that this came later on but I think that given that it's quite central in the um, Ashkenazi Levites it's probably quite an early um, an early influence into the Jewish people. Um, it, also if we look at uh, Zoroastrianism it doesn't actually talk about uh, anti-idol worship as far as I know in, in the literature but uh, one time I was reading this book called the Shahnami and it's quite a good um, ancient uh, history, um, kind of an epic uh, of, of Iran, uh, very early uh, Iranian literature. And in that, um, one of the heroes, Rustam, or the main hero, he goes to Kabul. But in, when he goes there, uh, he says, I shouldn't really go to this place because there's idols being worshipped here. And we don't like idol worship, we don't agree with it, so I shouldn't be going to this place. Uh, but he still goes because the people from Kabul and people from Iran were quite close quite closely linked culturally, but it seems there was this issue of idol worship that uh, Rustam, who is actually an Iranian, didn't uh, agree with. So this is probably an early idea in the Iranian religions that you shouldn't worship idols. Now the Iranians were quite close to the Indians, they were Indo-Iranians and they were all Indo-Europeans, but the Indians did worship idols, so did the Greeks and so did the, the Romans. And most likely uh, we think the Hittites probably did too, I think I saw in a documentary of the Hittites there was a few idols there. Uh, but uh, the, the Iranians didn't seem to worship idols and the Scythians didn't have many idols or I don't think they had any at all uh, similarly with the Germanic and Bato Slavic peoples so this anti-idol worship it seems to come from um, early Iranian religions and find its way into um, uh, as a defining uh, characteristic of the early Jews um, so but we don't actually know when uh, Abraham lived or if he actually was a real person or if he lived at a certain or wh when he actually lived um, uh, Jewish history really becomes concrete for us uh, in the post-exilic period. Prior to the exilic period, we don't actually have much um, literature uh, for the Jewish people. The Jewish exile happened around 600 BC or so. I'm not too sure on the dates. Um, I haven't actually researched this video too much uh, recently, but these are just things that I know. Maybe later on I can make another video with uh, more information, more evidence, something which is a bit more, a bit more researched in detail. But um, uh, the Exodic period was about 600 BC or 500 BC. Uh, the Jews were taken captive by the Babylonians who conquered uh, Israel and basically kicked them out of Israel and, or the elites and took them somewhere else uh, so they couldn't cause trouble in that region. It seemed like ancient Israel was quite an important region because it connected the east and the west and there's probably a lot of trade going through that region. So all the empires around there seem to have an interest in, uh, in Israel 
probably why uh, it's such a holy place and it's been fought over for so long for <coughs> uh, by so many different religions. Now, um, the Persians, when they took over that um, that region, they defeated the Babylonians. Uh, this is the Achaemenid Persian Empire, uh, about 500 BC, maybe 100 years after the Jews were taken into exile. They defeated the uh, uh, the Babylonian Empire and took over that region. When they took over, they said to the Jews that you can go back to you live in your area, but um, and we'll help you to build a temple as well. So the Persians actually helped them uh, build their first temp uh, or the second temple. And uh, well, the Jews had a decree from Cyrus that said um, we can build a temple here, and that's th that's the reason they were able to build that second temple. Um, regarding regarding the first temple, we don't actually know if that actually existed. Solomon's temple, not much has been found uh, of that archaeologically. Uh, similarly, with uh, it, the Judaic religion, we don't really know much about it prior to the Exodic period. There isn't really a um, uh, attested literature that goes back that far. Um, <clears throat> so it really, it seems like Judaism took a took shape, the modern Judaism took shape uh, post exilic in the post exilic period, uh, mostly due to influence from the Persians. Now the Persian religion, Zoroastrianism at that time, was a monotheistic religion. Some people say that it wasn't monotheistic, it was dualistic, this and that, but these are kind of more technical issues. The Persians were quite tolerant of different religions at that time. Um, they also believed in life after death and um, they believed in the universality of their religion so everyone could be a, um, a Zoroastrianism or, and it applied to everyone rather than the pre exilic uh, Judaic faith which didn't believe in uh, life after death and didn't believe in a monotheistic god you know they had different gods uh, in the pre exilic period they have Baal and Malak and some other gods and Yahweh obviously so they had different gods but um, there isn't really a strong uh, monotheistic tendency in Judaism until the post-exilic period and there isn't a belief, a belief in an afterlife and they don't even have a, a book you know the Torah seems to be um, compiled in the post-exilic period and um, the reason for that is that the Persians said to the Jews you know you can settle in this land and govern yourselves but you need to have a book or a, a written law to do so so this is when the Torah was compiled and similarly with the laws of Moses, we don't actually see these mo uh, these laws uh, in the pre-exilic period anywhere. We don't see any um, attestation of these laws in the pre-exilic period. Uh, the uh, the laws of Moses seem to be, be first sp spoken of uh, in the post-exilic period. Now the people who uh, uh, were sort of defining Judaism at this time, the sort of Jewish leaders, they would be people like Nehemiah and um, Ezra or Esther or I can't remember the names exactly, but all of these people uh, they were working for the Persian uh, royal house and they were basically taking instruction from the Persians and um, uh, it's interesting that uh, Cyrus is referred to as, a, uh, as the anointed one uh, or the Messiah or, or of Yahweh now these are terms, uh, the anointed one and the Messiah, these are terms that are not otherwise used for non-Jewish people uh, Cyrus is the only person given this um, sort of presti prestigious um, this, this label and it seems like that must be because he had a big influence on the Jews at the time. So uh, we can see that um, uh, a lot of the beliefs that then go into um, uh, Christianity and Islam, you know, the idea of just one God, the idea of uh, an evil being, a kind of dichotomy between the two, uh, the sort of the, the hereafter, the punishment, heaven and hell, and the judgment day, um, and uh, the fact that the soul lives on forever. Many of these ideas and others too that define these religions actually come from Zoroastrianism and ultimately come from a uh, Indo-European background rather than a, uh, a Semitic background. So it's important to understand that, and um, <coughs> many people don't. So um, and further on, if we look at Christianity and uh, um, Islam, we can see that there's many many uh, ways in which. Uh, the Iranians and Zoroastrianism influenced uh, these religions too but I'm not going to go into those details here in this video I just want to make a short video about the influence of Zoroastrianism on Judaism uh, the conclusion is that um, Judaism would be very different if it wasn't for the Persians and Persian influence uh, Persian influence really uh, shaped Judaism and ultimately the Abrahamic faiths are basically derived from uh, Zoroastrianism uh, they're just basically the same as Zoroastrianism. Islam and Christianity is very similar to Zoroastrianism. And I'm not really a, necessarily a big fan of Zoroastrianism, but I think it's uh, important to understand the Indo-European connections, um, especially the really early ones, because um, 
Uh, we think of the Abrahamic faiths uh, and we're taught in our education. We, everyone knows about Abraham, everyone knows about Moses and Noah. Uh, we think that these are really important concepts for uh, the Western world or even the world at large. Uh, for a long period, Christians ruled over the West and the Muslims ruled over the East. And it seemed like these Abrahamic religions were really shaping the world. But as a matter of fact, um, uh, these religions really come from an Indo-European background and uh, didn't really add much of um, original thinking. Most of the ideas, most of the new things that, um, and most of the negative things in the Abrahamic faiths are actually just um, uh, originally Semitic ideas. Um, because when, when these guys copied the religion from Zoroastrianism, they didn't understand exactly what they were doing, you know, because they didn't have that um, ancient religious philosophy or um, they didn't understand uh, the morality of the Indo-Europeans. So when they copied it, when they took these ideas, uh, they didn't do it so well. So we kind of ended up with these really um, kind of bad religions, uh, as it were. For instance, if we think of uh, Christianity and Islam, we, we know that if you're a non-believer, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still going to go to hell. And if you're if you're a believer, you're going to be punished. Uh, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. So it's just a case of uh, a kind of a strange morality where if you just believe in that religion, that's all that you have to do. This type of sentiment isn't really expressed in Zoroastrianism. Uh, Zoroastrianism is a little bit different. Zoroastrianism wasn't really the most tolerant religion uh, in the world. It wasn't um, a kind of polythe polytheistic religion. Uh, they did have some issues with the deva worshippers, and they did fight to stop worship of the. Um, the, old, the older gods, but um, other than that, it wasn't quite as bad as uh, Christianity and Islam. And you know, its main tenets are good thoughts, good deeds, and good actions. And um, it seems to be a more of a, a kind of uh, more of an objective morality rather than you know, you just worship this god and you're going to go to heaven. But it's more a case of, well, it seems to me that it's more of a case of if you're a good person, then you go to heaven rather than, you know, you have to worship this god in this way, exactly. That seems like more of a Middle Eastern idea, a Semitic idea, um, uh, which was transposed onto the Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian ideas to produce uh, Christianity and Islam. Now, regarding influences from the East, um, the, this idea of a prophet like Jesus, uh, you know, he was a prophet. Um, Zoroaster also called himself a prophet, and uh, we think that there were many others too, um, other similar religions, um, uh, where Christianity got its idea from. For instance, we know that Mithraism uh, was, was quite a uh, large religion in the uh, Roman Empire uh, in the pre-Christian times. Uh, that also has links to Iran and uh, converges uh, quite closely with Zoroastrianism uh, geographically, uh, although the religions are quite different. And um, we also have Manichaeism, uh, or Manike was, was a prophet. Um, and interestingly, this prophet, uh, I believe Manike is mentioned in, his, in the Shahnameh, um, I think it's Manike to talk about, it could be talking about some other prophet, some other person. But um, these these people, they had their religion, which was Zoroastrianism, and they had a sort of um, uh, this idea of uh, people doing a certain task or a kind of caste system or a certain organization of society. And they say that a prophet came to them, you know, and he, he preached equality, something a bit like Jesus Christ. He preached equality between the people, between the sexes, and just pure equality, a kind of social, uh, socialist type of idea, but an extreme socialist idea, you know, where he said anyone can do anything. And in this book, uh, the Shahnameh, they tell us that when this guy came and he preached and people accepted his message, um, all kinds of uh, stupid things were happening, you know, people weren't respecting their parents, people didn't know what job to do, this guy who was a priest, he, he started doing a different job and he couldn't do it, and uh, people started mixing and um, you know, men were acting like women, women were acting like men, and uh, it caused all kinds of problems in society. Uh, so this is a, um, something which is quite similar to what we're facing today, and this is something that, um, this kind of equality is something which uh, Jesus Christ and Muhammad also preached. They didn't really believe in a pre-structure uh, prior to their religion, they just believed in all equality uh, under their God, under their religion. And um, it's interesting that the Persians did really like this type of idea. And the Persians seem to be influential in the uh, death of Jesus. And they also say that uh, this prophet that they talk about in their book, who, who was coming up with these crazy ideas, uh, they also executed him. Um, and after that, you know, it, it, there, there was order again in their society. People, the priests went back to being priests. The workers went back to being workers. You know, men were acting like men and women were acting like women. And there was an order in their society that was um, uh, recreated again after th these kind of silly ideas of, of this kind of universal equality or everyone is just the same. Uh, after this, this so-called prophet tried to uh, introduce these ideas. And uh, I don't think they're talking about Jesus Christ. 
um, well they could be but it was it was an interesting thing that I found there uh, in the Shahnam it really does uh, reflect um, their, their ideas and kind of gives us a solution or um, tells us how they solve the problems that we have today uh, you know these ideas of socialism and hierarchy and things like that differentiation in society so there's a lot of interesting things in early Iranian literature Indo-European ideas that need to be looked at and um, I think that we need to look at these ideas a bit more and so I made this video just to talk about uh, the impact of Zoroastrianism and early Iranian ideas on um, on the Abrahamic faiths and as an example of the impact of uh, the Indo-European peoples and, and their ideas uh, and, and, and how we, we're sort of missing a big a big chunk of information that if you ignore the Indo-European stuff you're going to miss a lot of information that's going to make it difficult um, to talk about things uh, this is something which uh, I also found in Jordan Peterson uh, <coughs> in Jordan, Jordan Peterson's work uh, one of my main criticisms of him is that although he does make a lot of sense in many ways uh, when he talks about Christianity and a lot of the things that he talks about relating to religion, things like um, uh, logos and like order and truth in society these are not really Christian ideas though he attributes it to Christianity but these are actually um, Indo-European pagan ideas and um, I think he, he, either he doesn't know the material that well or uh, he's being dishonest but he shouldn't uh, it's a big mistake for him to attribute these ideas uh, these certain myths you know the, the myth of the hero and the dragon or the idea of logos and a certain uh, understanding of order uh, against chaos these are specifically uh, Indo-European ideas and they're very well um, <coughs> explained in Indo-European literature uh, they, they just are Indo-European ideas there's nothing in the Semitic tradition that we talk about these things really uh, elaborate on it, really explain it or even is consistent with these ideas these are all Indo-European ideas but Jordan Peterson doesn't really acknowledge that in any way so I think that um, really undermines his work and otherwise I would probably follow Jordan Peterson a bit more, I probably respect him a bit more but his lack of uh, historical knowledge in, in, this, um, uh, in this field makes it difficult for me to follow him uh, in conclusion I think uh, I just want to say that it's important to understand Indo-European traditions uh, Indo-European traditions need to be taken into account when um, talking about having any kind of religious debate or discussion or cultural issues even people talk about things like um, uh, the Judeo-Christian um, <coughs> basis of Western civilization uh, is simply not correct. Uh, the Western civilization, you know, to, to, to a large extent, has its roots in Indo-European traditions. It's true that Christianity did help to unify um, the continent of Europe, but um, there's still disparate cultures. I mean, Northern Europe uh, is more of a Scythian type of culture or has um, Scythian influences, and Southern uh, European cultures like Greek and Latin uh, they're more um, settled Indo-European cultures and this, this is uh, this how these things are split up uh, to say that Christianity had a big influence on, 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 on this society and unified these uh, different Indo-European groups it, it's not really, you know, they didn't really transform it that much um, then you have to also consider the effect of the Roman Empire um, which is another Indo-European society so this idea that uh, the European um, civilization is a uh, Judeo-Christian is simply factually incorrect and uh, people need to know that so that they don't continue to make that mistake uh, and they need to pay homage to the Indo-European um, ideas and talk about those because any discussion of history or religion is incomplete uh, and rather uh, pointless without discussing Indo-European